properly. So, sorry, there's a prompt there. So uh, I interviewed uh, uh, Microsoft and joined uh, over there. Uh, so looking back, I think it's still uh, very hard to make sense by my, for myself that I, I, I served for 10 years over there. And uh, partly, uh, I think the reason is that it didn't feel so long to me is because I, I, I've been mostly working in small uh, smaller teams, but part of larger projects. Uh, for example, the first thing I worked on is uh, advanced test tools. Uh, that's part of Real Studio in the grand theme. So where testers can uh, write their own little models in C# and generate test cases automatically, that's a pretty cool tool. And and then uh, later we moved on to uh, building diagnosis and troubleshooting tools for enterprise software. And later after cloud computing uh, started bo uh, booming, uh, I started to work on Azure uh, Resource Manager. And later uh, briefly in Bing, the search engine. And the last project I work in Microsoft is the uh, AI chatbot. Well, it was back in uh, six, year, six to seven years ago. So it has nothing comparable to what's capable uh, by the chat GPT today. But at that time it was quite cutting edge and uh, a, a, a very fun things to work, to work on. So I think I never really got bored working uh, for Microsoft, uh, but what made me leave is that, uh, you know, you get this, uh, Souvenir is a crystal. Every five years, uh, you serve in the company, and uh, uh, it gets larger and larger. So one morning, I woke up and saw that my my crystal, uh, the big one standing on my desk, and uh, I said to myself, uh, "Yeah, fuck, I I I've been there for too long time, so it's a time for for change." So uh, 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 a close friend invited me. He also uh, a previous coworker to join. Uh, to join uh, PD Mind, uh, which is a Siri B uh, SaaS, SaaS startup. Uh, the company works on uh, MarTech uh, products like uh, uh, analyzing web traffic on a website, tracking user behavior, and also uh, doing predictions, uh, serving personalized content, et cetera. So I, I spent there uh, like five years playing the CTO role. And uh, uh, to be honest, I think this five year taught me uh, even more than all the 10 years combined previously in, in Microsoft. So I think we'll, we'll touch that uh, uh, a bit later, but uh, it's basically on, on two fronts. On the uh, technical front, uh, because we're building complex web applications end to end. So below the surface, uh, we have ton, lots of data to crunch and ingest and the billions of data points every day. And above the surface, you need to build a very smooth user experience so that you can survive in this uh, uh, super crowded SaaS business and make money over there. And uh, this is on the technical front. On the non-technical side, I also got to really understand what, what it means to really run a business, right? What to watch. And also got to collaborate with the uh, very different roles of people like uh, customer support, the business analyst, the sales, marketing, etc. And uh, uh, for over a year, I've even been leading a uh, a full stack team of of my own uh, that combines the product team and also uh, sales, marketing, customer success team to together build a new product uh, facing a new market. That was quite a hell of a, a ride. I think the very big difference is that comparing uh, PD Mind to Microsoft, uh, Microsoft will continue spinning with or without me. I, I can make some contribution, but essentially I, I'm irrelevant, right? But in company of a size of a PD Mind, you get to uh, your 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 a good decision make a very big contribution, and your stupidity, your your bad move can make a serious damage to the company. So that's why. Uh, I, I, I got to understand what it really means to make decisions and take full responsibility. So uh, uh, after five years in PD Mind, I thought it might be another time to make a shift. So I left the CTO role, but continue playing a consultant role. But most of the time uh, is devoted into uh, with, a, with a close friend and with co-worker into building ZenStack, as uh, Akash said. It's a full stack open source development toolkit, uh, which is supposed to simplify full stack development with Node.js. Yeah, I'll just cover it briefly here. And later uh, we'll sh you, you will see uh, what it is really about at the end of the session. So it has some connection with my previous experience in PT Mind because we, we've been building web applications and we've seen so much inefficiency in the process, like front-end team and back-end team, they don't really understand each other's job and you need to pair people up so that to deliver a feature, 
And uh, those seemingly not so complex feature took so much time to to to, to land to ship. And uh, I just thought there ought to be some different ways of doing things with the new waves of tools and technologies and framework to make full stack development less intimidating and one more more pleasant and less painful thing to work on. Okay. So Akash, I think that I got maybe there's a question or you pre prefer me to move on. We address them later. Yeah, I think we can keep going for now. Uh, I'll collect okay. a few questions and we can address them together. Cool, yeah. cool, cool. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, uh, about uh, my my background. I uh, hope it's kind of interesting. And uh, the topic today is about uh, learning. So uh, why, why do we talk about learning, right? Uh, well, the first reason is I, I know that uh, Akash and Jovian is building this fantastic full stack bootcamp, right? That's supposed to help people learn full stack development. So I thought, uh, yeah, to uh, join, to participate, participate in the webinar, maybe talk about learning would be fun. And it's it makes very good sense in today's world because everybody's got so much to learn today, right? So software development has become so complicated compared to 20 years ago. And uh, there are so many languages and uh, tools and libraries and framework. Well, they're supposed to make our lives easier. But at the same time, I think they put a lot of stress and anxiety in, in terms of le learning that we all feel that we, we need to learn things, keep learning things. So back to the question we got in the, in the, in the, in the, in the chat said, uh, somebody asked how to uh, continue to make a continued learning in the, in the career. I don't think you need to worry about that. You will be forced to learn, learn a lot and continue doing that. When you feel that you can stop learning, it means that the, 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 the industry is kind of doomed. It's not uh, interesting anymore. So, so I thought learning is an interesting topic, but at the same time, I think it's a very broad and also a, a personal uh, topic, right? So uh, talking about the learning, any specific thing may not be interesting to some of the audience here. So I thought maybe we can move a uh, level up, right? So let's talk about meta learning. So what, what is meta learning? So uh, first of all, it has nothing to do with Facebook. Uh, you make friends there, but you don't really learn there. Uh, you hear the word meta a lot in the software industry. So like metadata, meta programming, et cetera. So a meta X um, basically means uh, X of X, right? Metadata means data of data. Well, and meta learning means learning of learning. So uh, I'm going to try to share uh, some of the tips that's reflected from my uh, my personal experience about how to learn effectively. And uh, they've been working well for me. And I think some of them may be of helpful to you uh, as well. Okay, let's uh, get to the the real content, uh, the, the, the tips. Uh, I think the very first one is about the uh, the mental model, uh, the mentality, and also the altitude uh, when we, uh, the attitude when we start uh, learning something, right? Uh, I think it's a it's a it's a common thing that when we start to learn something new, uh, we get into a passive mode, right? That's maybe a trauma carried over from our schooling age. So especially for Eastern people like I am, that learning is mostly about comprehending and memorizing things, right? We automatically in, enter that kind of a mode. Uh, but I, I, a trick that uh, I, I found uh, fairly useful to me is that just try to inverse this uh, this passive uh, uh, mentality and make it really a, an active process. So how to do that, right? Uh, as the title says, right, uh, it takes two steps. One is that whatever tool or library framework you are learning, first try to understand what kind of problem is trying to to resolve, right? For example, React is about uh, uh, helping you build your UIs with uh, better efficiency and also uh, uh, locality between your, 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 your code and your, your UI, et cetera. So understand the problem. And then uh, think about the given my current level of knowledge in the related domain, no matter high or low it is, right? How would I uh, proceed with, 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 with devising a, a solution, right? It doesn't matter how coarse it is, just, uh, just try, to, try to do that. So uh, then the process of learning a thing becomes effectively a, a like a imaginary uh, dialogue between you and the, the two creator, right? So uh, it, it's like play, playing a chess. You, you make a move, you make a proposal uh, that, that I'm going to solve the problem this way and then check with the author's idea, right? 
Uh, it's very often, I think, you will find a big gap, right? The author's uh, opinion is much better than what you have. It's obvious because he's been, he's been spending so much time thinking about the problem and also uh, check with many people's idea. That's how it's become a successful tool, right? But it doesn't matter, right? Just keep uh, playing this uh, game uh, step by step and uh, you will learn how it works uh, during the process, but you will also engage in a, a very active uh, mental workout uh, during during the process. So why the why why take the trouble to do that? Right, I think it brings two uh, main benefits. One is that uh, it makes the learning process a more enjoyable thing. So instead of staying passive, you uh, act actively. You engage in active uh, virtual conversation and act, act active mental uh, workouts. Right, this is more fun than passive learning. A second one is that. Uh, during this process, you tend to uh, build up a empathy with all with the author because you try to replace the re replay the the process of thinking through the problem and devising a solution. So, with this process embedded in in your knowledge, you will find yourself in a better position in the future when you start to utilizing the tool uh, in your work. Okay, so the next one is about how to balance learning the fundamentals and the cool things, uh, the new stuff, the modern things, uh, ways of doing things. Yeah, don't stare at the formula, it's just uh, irrelevant. It's a rendered, random decoration to the, to the topic. Um, so I've seen people uh, who try to learn React uh, without a solid understanding of uh, JavaScript. And I think this is uh, simply against the physics. Uh, and uh, it may even be poisonous because it can distort your view of the JavaScript uh, language, right? So today, software development has become a vast domain containing uh, so many tall buildings, right? Those buildings are knowledge and domains, and they are interconnected. But each one is, uh, is a fairly tall, has lots of things to learn, right? So. When you enter a such a new such a new building, right, is uh, that's that you ever never learned before, it's tempting to take a quick lift and get onto the top as quick as possible. Enjoy the view, uh, the nice view uh, up in the roof, right? And uh, in in this metaphor, uh, so basically you see, see, skip the foundation, and the lift is like the modern tools and the practices uh, that are designed for development development with efficiency. And they usually achieve the efficiency by hiding fundamental stuff so that you can just uh, do things quicker. So what's the problem? So there's a, there is a problem in, in it because uh, the state of art tools and uh, frameworks for a domain, they're more like fashion. We've, we've all seen that, right? So every year, every, every, every month, there will be new uh, JavaScript uh, framework uh, invented. Every year, there's a new language, and some language become popular out of the blue. They're like fashion. They change from season to season. But what's really constant and stable are the primitives in, in the domain, right? So uh, think about the different examples for uh, web development, for front-end development. Since the very beginning, it has, it has been HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and it never changed for these decades, right? Still the same thing. And for database development, it's always been the SQL languages, the relations, and the transactions, always the same thing. For machine learning, the basics, drivers, it's always linear algebra, calculus, and the statistics, right? Yeah. So I understand that today, nobody still writes complex applications with vanilla JavaScript. It's just too slow, right? And few, fewer people are writing raw SQL in, in their product because it's too, gen, too, too dangerous, prone to injection, et cetera. And also machine learning models can be trained with a few lines of code, right? Without you worrying about too much things. But still, uh, if you can grasp the, the, the primitive, primitives, spend some, spend some time over there, and uh, it, this will help you adapt to whatever changes that's going to happen on the surface. And you will be better off with adapting with the trends when you move on with the uh, inside of the domain and you know, in your career.
Okay. Uh, the next tip uh, is a uh, uh, probably contro controversial one. We can we can we can we can discuss about it. It's about uh, tutorial uh, how how well they work and uh, uh, versus the effectiveness of uh, uh, real world problems. Uh, we all love tutorials. Uh, me myself, we love writing tutorials. We love uh, following tutorials. Uh, so first thing I build my own project, I start writing tutorials and post them for people to, to, to easier to get uh, up to speed using it. Uh, tutorials help us uh, to uh, make achievement fast, right? Uh, make us feel that we're learning things fast, make us feel uh, feel better, feel that we're getting better fast, right? Uh, but the secret of uh, becoming a, an excellent engineer is that is usually not the result of incremental daily improvements, but instead you make a series of leaps leveraging different opportunities. So that's how you'll become a much st stronger develop developer over the time. So what are these opportunities for making the leaps? So in my opinion, that are those are really the tough real world problems. They are the opportunities. So they are like this image. They are the mushrooms for uh, Super Mario, right? So utilizing them give you a solving these difficult problems give you a boost simultaneously on, on, on several aspects, like uh, more solid knowledge and uh, better code fluency, and also better design skills, uh, debugging techniques, and also make you a more confident and even make you have uh, better taste uh, when it comes to uh, preferences, etc. Right. For example, uh, it, it's it's great if you read an article about the JavaScript uh, uh, garbage collection, how it works, right? It make, makes you more knowledgeable. But really only by deeply troubleshooting a performance problems in real, real, real world product makes you a expert in that domain of uh, garbage collection. So why are uh, real world problems so so much more effective than tutorials. So I think the one of the biggest reason is that uh, uh, those uh, problems are tough because they are they are they are very weird. Uh, I think many people here probably ever practiced the writing algorithm solving algorithm algorithm questions on lead code, right? So lead code questions are uh, difficult, right? They are very mentally challenging. But real world problems, they are at the same time difficult and also very weird. So resolving them and devising a working solution usually requires you to really grasp the essence of the related knowledge. So that's a great process that can help you for internalizing things that have been wandering around in the shallow layer of your brain. So organize them and let them sink to be a really part of you your, yourself. So this process of internalization, to my opinion, is probably the, the key to this successful learning of almost everything. So you may ask that, uh, so where can I find these opportunities? It's not really hard. It only takes some training to your eyes to identify those tiny spots of inefficiency and weird problems and take your time into invest, invest into really working on them. You will find plenty of them. Uh, Akash, uh, do you think we can we should take a break to for some questions, or we can move on? Sure. Yeah, I think we have lots of questions coming in. Okay, uh, cool. Thanks for sharing the tips so far. It's already been very insightful. So let's take a few questions. Yeah. Um, the, the first question is from Mohit. He asks, "Do you think doing an MS in CS is required to break into tech uh, into a career in tech in the current world scenario?" Well. Uh, I think obviously not. Uh, well, it's uh, not based on my opinion because I have them, but I've been working with people who transition from different kinds of roles, even from li literature, they are uh, equally successful. Uh, but I, I think probably you need to be pre prepared about uh, different uh, ways of entering uh, the tech industry, right? For example, uh, I, I, I've seen people who transition from like designer roles into front-end developer, developer fairly uh, smoothly, right? Because they are... Uh, uh, user oriented and uh, their visual and uh, uh, you you don't need to worry about too 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 much deep things initially, right? Although front end developer can take a fairly deep, and if you want to tackle from the backend side, uh, 
uh, because it's more related to the fundamental knowledge about uh, how the operation system works and the, the backend program languages and uh, these uh, weird kind of uh, uh, problems with the uh, concurrency, etc. So you you probably need to be pre prepared to spend more time to uh, make up for the knowledge gap. But I don't think any of them really take any formal. Uh, education in the, in a college or university because today there are so abundant of books and uh, online courses and the self study resources open source code you can study I don't think that would be ever be a problem anymore. Makes sense. No, uh, okay. Then Kelmet asks, uh, "Hello, Yiming. You have had a feel of what a mega corporate world is like and what the entrepreneurial front is like." For an aspiring entrepreneur hoping to join the corporate world for survival uh, first, would you recommend that they aim for big stable corporates or work at, or work at startups? Uh, we'll, we'll actually talk about that in terms of learning. learning. There's, a, there's a slide about it. Yeah, so okay. yeah, sure, I think it, uh, it, I, it, to my opinion, it's very good to alternate your uh, career between big ones and small ones because they... Uh, they are they are very they have different things to enjoy and they provide very different things to to to, to learn right well, well we'll touch that uh, uh, in in a few minutes I guess okay fair enough um, yeah okay here is one more question from Demi do you have any kind of mantra when you are working on a subject actively I'm asking because I get into I get in I get to become I become passive um, in the end whenever I try to be an active learner so how to be more active about learning something uh yeah i think it's a tough question <laughs> uh yeah so the 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 tip i already shared right it's about uh, trying to play a creator role right i think it's right. already more exciting to think that you are creating something instead of just uh, passively learning something but also uh i think it really also helps when you can uh pair with somebody to learn something that's uh that's fairly tough, right? So that you kind of uh, uh, you 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 establish a, a peer pressure to make progress, right? That's right. also a way of uh, being active uh, because you want to you don't want to be left up, uh, behind and kind of make a commitment to your partner on on, on learning. So that's another thing. I also feel helpful. So I, I think we also have used to have this kind of learning group where people put a deposit small amount of money to. To to like make a commitment, uh, so you you lose really lose some money if you fail to uh, hit some goal, right? It's, yeah, there's right. tricks you can yeah you can use. So create accountability by maybe getting into a group, maybe putting some money, or just by uh, like starting a project. Great. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Okay, then not a question, but Rex says, uh, Yiming, you are a true inspiration. Uh, just this was he posted this when you were talking about your background, so I just wanted to drop in that small uh, comment there and there is one uh, also another question from Hannah uh, not again not really a question but it is about the the slide which had the formula please tell me that you can be average which means you can not know the formula and still make it in this field oh sorry uh, the question was uh, if you can skip uh, like understanding formula to yeah yeah the, the formula that you showed on the screen the integration formula okay yeah so the question is uh do you need to know? Do you need to understand this formula to make it in software development? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, it's a, it was a bad choice. I uh, just pick a random picture over there. Yeah, you. Well, it, it depends, right? It depends on really on, on what what you want to do. If you want to be a front end or full stack developer, you don't you don't need to master calculus. Although it's fun, right? But it's it's op optional. But if if you want to be a serious machine learning, uh developer, right? even if you work on the engineering side, I think it makes very good sense still to relearn uh, the basic mathematics about calculus, uh, algebra, et cetera, uh, so that, uh, well, you, you can you can have a full understanding on, on the thing you're working on. You can talk uh, more fluently with the uh, data scientists, right? Otherwise, there, there's going to be a gap in between you. Yeah. So, uh, one thing I just, just just want to add, I think one thing that I learned in Microsoft is, is that I had the chance to work with some researchers. It was a unique opportunity, but uh, the it, it helped me to break a mental uh, barrier that you cannot really get into theoretical stuff, right? It's, it's not the case. It's, it's all just about the learning, right? So after a while, I got used to, you know, 
uh, this uh, used to be ha have very difficult conversation, like people speaking different languages. But if you just put time into learning, right, the gaps just very quickly disappear. You feel that you can confidently walk in between uh, the pragmatic engineering side and also the relatively theoretical and uh, mathematical side without. Well, it's, it's still hard, I think. Yeah, but uh, it's not. It's not so impossible. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That you have to have this perspective of whatever is required. I will try and figure it out and learn it. Yeah, makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, that's probably yeah. the most important. Thing. Yeah. Great. All right. I think these are some other questions um, till now, but you can continue and then we can maybe take more questions towards the end. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for the questions. Okay. Uh, I think the, 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 the following uh, tips are more like uh, related to, uh, to, to really learning in, in, in jobs, right? Yeah. So, uh, so after graduate graduation from either graduation from computer related uh, college with degrees, or you do self preparation to from other uh, profession into the tech domain, well, we we all need to think about where do we start, right? Like we start in small companies and start in big ones, as the uh, audience asked this question, right? I think the reality is that uh, initially we also often can't freely choose where we start, right? But you ought to start uh, after you finish your preparation. And uh, uh, wherever you start, I, I've seen people, no matter where they start, that they can have an equally successful career just by uh, continuing working on it. But I think uh, we should all be prepared about the very different uh, characteristics about the kind of learning opportunities that the big companies and the small companies they can offer respectively so that we can ut utilize them, them and also don't be too disappointed with your uh, expectation. So let me take Microsoft as an example. Uh, it's uh, obviously a tech giant uh, and uh, it's quite uh, bureaucratic actually. Uh, but it offers a lot of uh, perks uh, in terms of uh, growth and learning. But for example, these uh, uh, lots of uh, training courses. Uh, some are delivered by internal people, some by uh, procured uh, externally uh, quite expensively. And also there are uh, uh, mentorship programs organized by HR departments. Uh, and also uh, there are well-defined career mo growth models. Uh, it uh, uh, outlines for getting certain uh, level of career, what kind of a competency you need to uh, possess to, to be qualified. But I found none of them useful, uh, personally, to be honest. And the real thing that I felt useful in, uh, in large companies is that given that they have uh, established the business model and the abundant cash flow, they can afford the luxury of engineering excellence. So by engineering excellence, I mean to trade the velocity and the efficiency of uh, development for a better engineering practice. So there are examples. For example, in Microsoft, it's uh, quite common to have several people review your code uh, before you commit, and you can have several rounds of discussions and debates. You can have dedicated design review meetings. Uh, your team probably have a very rigorous uh, bar for test coverage before you can commit your code into the branch. And also you can write sufficient documentation and even you can refactor your code before it gets too ugly. But these all cost the money, right? So well, you can say that maybe they result in better overall efficiency, but uh, that's really hard to say. But I think only the advantage of the uh, healthiness of the uh, large companies can, can afford this kind of uh, investment. So this kind of continuous in-job training is very valuable. Uh, for developers and for me, uh, because it makes you it makes it a habit for you to always think through problems uh, very carefully and uh, uh, always deliver quality design and code with our very first shot. So it, it, it helps tremendously for the future of the of the career. Well, coming to the other extreme, a small company, early startups. Of course, there is a very broad range in between, but you can probably interpolate interpolate uh, what it looks like. So for very small company like PDMine, uh, we cannot afford such formality. 
you'll probably be already happy if there is a simple code review process there and somebody needs to click approve button so that your call before your code goes live. Uh, that, that's good. But instead, you, you, you have lots of freedom, right? Uh, you can implement things following your own ideas. But of course, sometimes you make things wrong, but you learn from the consequences directly. You need to uh, fix your shit very, very quickly, right? I think the main benefit of learning in this smaller environment is coming from the lack of protection, right? The protection from your peer, your uh, senior members, your supervisor, your CTO, et cetera. And uh, this lack of protection can be a very good thing for learning, right? Uh, yeah, because uh, you have to be responsible for the, for the things that you work on and the, uh, the, the feedback comes in so instantly and so brutally that you have to face them and figure out how to deal with them. And this is also very valuable way of, of learning things. But of course, you can try to get a balance, right? Even in a smaller company, try to get more senior people to to guide you from time to time. But uh, essentially, you're more on your uh, on your on your own, rely on uh, external resources to to make uh, uh, formal growth in your in, in your in your expertise. And another uh, very big uh, benefit working in a smaller company is that you often get to uh, have the opportunity to understand how a product works end to end. Uh, like for example, you can even uh, read through the source code and debug the system end to end to, to really uh, grasp uh, how, how it really works under the hood. But this is often impossible if in uh, much larger projects because it's just so much more complex. So as I said, I think ideally you can alternate your career in between the smaller one and the bigger companies, but it's probably a good idea to be prepared uh, 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 psychologically for the different ways that uh, these environments pro provide opportunities for, for, for learning and growth. I hope I answered the previous question, but we can continue to chat uh, if, uh, if there's uh, more to explore. Okay, so now, now that we've uh, uh, started to talk about in-job learning, a natural topic is then about mentorship, right? So what kind of mentorship really works? I think it's, it's a very popular topic. Uh, I think mentorship, good mentorship is invaluable, but they're so hard to find, right? Uh, I, I've been uh, playing the mentor and mentee role for many times in my career. And uh, to my observation, many of them, I, I can say most of them, very quickly turn into a pleasant social connection, right? So some connections uh, stayed for a very long time, for a few years, but they just didn't work out as what I expected initially from a, a mentorship that help you learn serious things and grow, right? Uh, so based on my experience, I think the one of the most successful mentorship I had, uh, a mentor, was in the early days that I started to work in Microsoft. It was it's a unique opportunity. Uh, so my, my mentor was a co-worker in, in my team and much more senior than I than I am, uh, much more older than I am, also senior, yeah. And also it's unique because he's uh, he's German. Uh, if you ever work with German people, uh, I'm not sure if there are German people, sorry, uh, people from German, Germany in the, in the session, but uh, they're, they're, they're very direct uh, and frank and uh, uh, don't care to hide their uh, feelings and emotions. So it's kind of a, uh, me from an Eastern culture are more like uh, indirect and polite and shy, et cetera. So there was some interesting culture conflict initially. That was fun. And also uh, he, he came from a research background, uh, was a, a scientist in computer science and joined our product to build, uh, uh, build uh, products, right? And many, many people, I think they, they hold a, a stereotype uh, opinion towards research people that they, they write shitty code. Uh, but that's not the case, right? So he's an amazing person who can uh, think through problems very systematically and translate them into uh, clean and easy to understand code. And this helped me, just observing him helped me tremendously and uh, during that period of time. So I tried to extract uh, some quotes about uh, uh, effective mentorship and these are the points I, I, I got. The first uh, thing is that uh, supposedly, I, I think ideally the mentor uh, uh, should work in the domain, same domain or close domain that you are. Otherwise, uh, it's very easy to have conversation that's uh, 
uh, that's floating, that's abstract, and uh, tend to be a waste of time for, for both of you. And secondly, uh, it would be great if you get the opportunity to really observe firsthand how he works, right? Check out his code, uh, discuss, uh, check out how he th thinks through problems and check out his design, right? It's easier if that you work on the same project, right? If uh, uh, he's on a separate team, just maybe more indirect, but create this opportunity. The reason why you need to do that is that, is that uh, I think because people's thoughts are usually volatile. So the way they talk uh, may change from day to day, depending on, on their mood and on their relation to you, right? But what's more stable and reliable and faithful is their work, right? Their, their work usually more truthfully uh, reflect their, their true talent to try to learn from there uh, instead more. The third thing is that uh, you, you ought to have uh, in-depth dis discussions on very concrete problems with your mentor. So although uh, we all know that the, the purpose of mentorship is not about solving any concrete problem, but only by solving concrete problem together, you got to observe uh, his thinking pattern, right? The way how he tackles and analyzes problems and see how his train of thought differs from, from, from yours, right? So those are the little gems that you really want to become from a successful mentorship experience. Yeah, that's my reflection for my previous experience. Okay, so the next topic is about a thing that I think all make us frustrated. So if I could make a vote, I, I think I, I probably wanted to ask how many of the audience have ever had a frustration that you wanted to try something new in your pro project, but was denied by your supervisor or your CTO, et cetera, because they think it's too risky and cannot be afforded for an ongoing product, right? So uh, we, are, we, are, we are all tied by status quo. And uh, sometimes we suffer from maintaining a outdated technical stack. And what's worse is that even you have a new stack today, it can very quickly become outdated in, in just a matter of one or two years because the world is just evolving so fast. But at the same time, we also have the anxiety that we, we need to, we ought to learn new things, right? We ought to catch up with the new trends, but how can we learn effectively without really practicing them in, 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 in the work? So how, how does that happen, right? I think there's a solution and uh, that applies to uh, almost everyone in every, every, every environment. You just need to be observant to find those corner opportunities in work and be diligent to work on them and spend time into them. And at the same time, try out new things. So in that way, you can really try out the things you want to try without scaring any people. And people will even thank you for working on something that has been ignored for quite some time. So I have some uh, uh, actual experience from my, from, from my past <clears throat> career. For example, I, I learned Python uh, seriously, I think fairly late. Uh, that was uh, due to uh, because of a, a ad hoc opportunity uh, when we needed to build a crawler system for our product uh, uh, very quickly. And I thought Python is uh, good at uh, crawling and also parsing, uh, extracting information from web pages. So I pick it up and uh, uh, to my surprise, the system became something that has been actively maintained for quite some time. Another example is that uh, I don't know how many people ever heard about the language named Closure. Uh, it's a, a functional programming language that runs above JVM. Uh, our previous company used the tool called Metabase for uh, building dashboards to show business results and the growth metrics. So we needed to write a plugin for Metabase and you have to write it in Clojure. So I spent uh, uh, the weekend to uh, pick up the language and just try to uh, wrap, wrap my mind fast to, to, to deliver that plugin so that our, 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 our business team can uh, connect in new data source to see their data. To be honest, I think I probably will never use that language again in, in the future because it's just not very mainstream. But still, it's a, it's, it's a fun thing to learn functional programming is, and it's also quite eye-opening for me. Third example is about machine learning. 
I built my first serious machine learning model when we needed to experiment a highly experimental feature for our clients by uh, analyzing for analyzing their anomaly in their on their website traffic. Uh, so that's a, a a nice way to try out uh, building models in whatever way you want uh, because we're not we're, we're we're so unsure if we're ever going to ship the feature. Yeah, I think uh, there are plenty of such opportunities you can you can find and be brave to try out new things and people will, will, will love you and uh, thank you for that. And if you finally still find it so hard to find these opportunities, there are so many open source projects, right? You can spend time on uh, during a weekend to find the interesting ones, contact the maintainer to try to contribute code things, things to that. The opportunities are endless now. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I've been dragging, dragging pretty long. So this is the uh, last tip about learning. So it's actually not about technical stuff anymore, but more about uh, vision and uh, related to the business side of things, right? So uh, some of us, I think, uh, will choose to switch to a either management or uh, business role uh, somewhere down the path over the career. But many of us uh, will plan to uh, stick to the technical path. But nonetheless, I think uh, it's, it's always beneficial to get yourself exposed to business side of stuff. And you should do it as early as possible. But why is the case, you might ask, right? Especially when you're entering, just entering the, the, the tech industry uh, as a junior member. So, uh, I think... Uh, one 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 biggest reason is that as we mature as developers, uh, we will find a very sad reality. Uh, the reality is that the real difficulty in software engineering building products is not really about uh, picking a fancy design or implementing a complex algorithm or model, right? It is always about how to support the business well, and that can be fairly subtle and boring. Just think about those uh, those subtle logic in the business that you need to, those are not fun, but you need to make sure they work right, right? And uh, these, these infinite changes in requirements that's made by your product team. And also those seemingly random moves from your CEO about the direction of your products, right? So imagine in the future, you will evolve into a architect role, right? So an architect is supposed to, you know, steer the technical direction of the company and the, 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 the product, right? And a good architect, I think, besides beside good at uh, steering a direction and making high-level architecture, he's also supposed to be very good at two other things. One is at resolving business problem, problems in a very pragmatic way, right? pragmatic way. And the other one is the ability to foreseeing the future of the product. So how 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 where does this vision come from? How do they possess them? Right? I think very uh, very easy. It's not easy, but very straightforward. Just get involved in the real world business, right? Uh, by doing things like checking user feedback, and meeting with clients, participating with uh, customer support analyzing business results and uh, resolving pains of your sales and marketing team, et cetera. So by actively participating in these uh, business side activities, you, you will start to build up a very vivid image of how your customers look like. So how your products are sold, why do your custom, the customer buy them, how they use it, what kind of problem they solve it for them. And also you will possess a fuzzy image about the future of the product, how in which direction it's going to going to evolve, so you you can act proactively and start to inject preparations in today's work. So is that a very cool thing to do, right? But this is not limited to uh, architect, right? It, it, it can be done to a great extent uh, uh, from our junior stage of career. Just uh, get your hand, hand dirty and be interested in on the business side stuff and how things really work, right? And you will you will learn a lot from those. So I think every CEO and CTO they will love brilliant programmers in in the company. But you know what kind of person they love even more? Those brilliant programmers 
who also understand the customer, understand how they what they want and how they use the thing, right? So possessing that, I think you will be a very invaluable asset uh, uh, in whatever company you work in. Okay, yeah, I think uh, it's time to uh, wrap up. Uh, I've, I've shared a lot of uh, random ideas. I hope it's uh, useful to you. And the very last tip I, I, I want to give is that uh, uh, fundamentally, I think you, you ought to love what you do, right? Uh, so we often need to make uh, uh, decisions very early in our life, important decisions like uh, uh, choosing a major in college and uh, picking a career uh, or even marrying a person when we we're very young. But uh, uh, it's also often that the things turn out to be very different from what you expected, right? So when that happens, it's, it's, uh, it's important that you persevere, right? You, you, you try hard to rediscover your passion over there. But still, it's possible, I think, if you try really hard, you still find yourself lost. It's also a wise action to cut, cut your loss in time and look elsewhere. So since we, we've been talking about learning in, in the very general terms today, so I, I think this knowledge will be helpful maybe uh, for whatever uh, career that it, you, you end up you know, doing in, in whatever profession, uh, just have a very happy and uh, fruitful uh, lifelong learning proce process ahead. Yeah, thank you. That's all I, I want to share today, and I'll give it back to Akash. Great. Um, thanks a lot, Yiming. I think those were all some pretty incredible trips. And I was just listening and uh, thinking about how I want to apply those in my career. So uh, thank you so much for sharing them. And there are lots of questions. There are a ton of questions. So by the way, uh, if would love to get a reaction from the audience. Please post in the chat. How did you find the tips? Which tips stood out to you the most? Uh, just let us know in, in the chat. And we are going to start taking some questions now. So uh, I can see one question here from Swapnil, and uh, this is a question that we get a lot, which is if chat GPT AI can code, then what will be the future of software development? Are our jobs in danger? Should we try, Should we start looking for other opportunities? So I just wanna uh, throw that at you first, and then we'll take some more. Yeah, I kind of expected this kind of question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ChatGPT is amazing. I, I use it a lot. And uh, also a uh, related thing, Copilot of GitHub is also amazing. I, I can't live without uh, it while, while coding today. But uh, first of all, they're built by a human, right? Uh, they need to continue uh, improve, uh, they continue being improved, right? So uh, I think it makes sense to think about the future that we, whether uh, we should consider, consider being part of the effort of building more AI in the future. Uh, that'd be amazing. But if it, it, that's not the case for you, uh, don't be don't be scared. I, I've been uh, having this kind of conversation with friends, and and one of my opinion is that uh, it's not uh, you know the real difficulty I think in building a product is really a, about uh, explaining very clearly what you are going to build, right? What are the requirements? What are the subtle rules? Right? What are the, what are the unique experience experience you want to build into the product so that it can be successful? And these kind of things are so difficult to explain, even from human to human. Just imagine how much time you spend, how many hours you spend with PM to really uh, clarify things, right? I don't think AI today is going to uh, be as great as understanding all these uh, complexity in explaining what we're really going to build. I think they, they will help tremendously on micro level by complete uh, giving a implementation of your function, right? Uh, adding comments to, to your code, right? Sometimes they write code even better than you do, right? But as I said that the real difficulty is not really about implementing any specific function. It's really about understanding what you're going to build and devising a pragmatic solution, overall solution, including architecture implementation and also collaborating with other roles to, to do it. So that that's why Software engineering is called engineering. It's not, not called coding or programming. It's a comprehensive thing, right? Writing code is yeah. only a part of it. That's that's my take. Great. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. It's uh, <clears throat> it's almost like it's getting easier and easier to go from thought to code, but the thought is still important, which is understanding the user, understanding the requirements, and the subtle things that you talked about. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. But also be very careful to review the code generated by Code yeah. Pilot or ChatGPT. There's, yeah, it's not so possible, at least for now. <laughs> yeah, at least for now, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, next question here. Uh, this is a question from Ashish, by the way, and he mentions that he is currently in 11th grade. So he is currently just starting to learn a lot of things. He says that I have learned multiple programming languages like Rust, Python, Flutter, and JavaScript. However, whenever I switch between different technologies, such as writing backends in Python to Laravel from or, or to Laravel or from Angular to Next.js, I tend to forget the concepts of the previous technology. So, what to do about this? Because there's so many languages and frameworks. Yeah. So everybody does that. Everybody forgets. I, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. Except for very exceptional people. And you're great uh, because I uh, Rust is still in my queue of learning. I haven't really picked it up yet. So that that's natural. Uh, I think uh, very often it's like a muscle memory, right? If you if you learn ski, uh, you 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 forget it after first uh, several tries. But if you ski for several years, you tend to remember it, right? Programming is the same. Uh, I think eventually you will pick maybe two or three main language you want to stick to, right? That will be your go-to language when you start to work on new things, right? And then. Well, there will still be need for picking up different things, right? Maybe sometimes you need, you need to relearn. But I, I, I think the, the thing I want to add is that uh, as your experience uh, accumulates, as you uh, learn more language, languages, you will start to have this creator mentality as we shared in, in, the team, in the tips, right? You will sometimes start to think, how would I devise a language, right? why some aspects of this language sucks and how I want to, want to fix it, right? So this makes it so much easier to switch between languages because you, you see the commonality, right? There's just different ways of expressing things, but you, you also very quickly grasp the uniqueness, right? That, to, that, that makes you want to stick to, to the language, right? Yeah, so I think there's no need to be afraid of uh, forgetting about things when you start to real job, right? The the The... The workload will force you to build up uh, muscle memory very, very soon, right? Yeah. So that's forgetting things that we don't use very often is very natural, but there's nothing to worry about, I think. Great. Uh, okay. Next question here. This is a general question from Norbu about web development versus app development, mobile or native app development. Where do you see, since you've seen many waves of this, where do you see this trend going? Okay. So I might have a very biased opinion, right? I, I'm very fond of web de development and uh, I have very limited uh, uh, knowledge about app development. But I think uh, uh, web development is the future uh, for several reasons, right? One reason is, is that if you uh, watch the trend, you will see that browsers are getting so much stronger year by year. And also the uh, technology uh, already allows uh, browser-based applications to behave very similar to uh, native apps, right? You can install them on the desktop and launch instantly and also catch data locally, right? These are amazing things that's uh, squishing the, the, the space of native apps, right? This is the for the, on the technical side. And on the non-technical side, when you're building app, you always face uh, the problem of uh, the distribution channel, right? You need to launch them on the app stores. Uh, they charge commission and you need to run promotion. Well, for app, web apps, you need, uh, need to also run campaigns, but uh, it's a it's a much opener uh, platform, right? Everybody has browser, you're just uh, free to deliver. You're not controlled by the regulation of the uh, distributor of Android or, or iOS. So that's also what I think that these uh, uh, web-based apps will probably be a uh, more, even more mainstream in the future, yeah, uh, compared to app. But also, you know, there are lots of apps just embed web views, right? Uh, so you, all, you also use the same framework like React, React Native to build things. So, so the technology, the, the, the learning is quite interchangeable. That's also a very good thing. Yep. Uh, do you think native apps will go away completely? Or do you think that there is always like some kind of use cases for which you will have to build native apps? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, it's just like uh, whether desktop client apps will go away, right? There are scenarios like gaming and also highly interactive uh, things. Uh, and also, for example, on uh, 
on my on my desktop, I still use sometimes Photoshop. Uh, I don't use it in the web version. I use the desktop version for app app as well. Yeah, there were there there are cases. Yeah, but uh, it's just that, that uh, I think uh, with a more power brow browser, these cases will be uh, probably in a smaller and smaller uh, range in the future. Yeah, yeah, especially with tools like Figma, they've actually started to approach the performance of Photoshop too now slowly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you're interested, in, they also can check out WebAssembly to see how they resolve uh, perform performance issues uh, in traditional web apps, right? Which is also amazing. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And next question is from Chinmay. And I think we'll take maybe two or three more. We're already over time, but uh, so many people have posted questions. So Chinmay <laughs> asks, uh, how do we simulate real world problems when learning a new language or tech stack? Yeah, that's a... That's a tough question. Uh, I, I think it's uh, fairly difficult to really simulate, right? But you can go as far as you want. So there's a, uh, there's a, there's a way how people do this. For example, uh, when, I build a pro uh, when I build a toolkit, right? I need to build demo applications. To make them feel re real, I, I clone other uh, successful apps, right? So that kind of will make it a real experience. It's just a matter of uh, how far you want to go because it really, if you clone, clone it fully, it gets really complicated. You, you probably can't afford it, but you can set the scope, right? I want to replicate these essential features. So as full fidelity as I, I said, I can get. So in this way, I think you get really close to a simulation of, of a real thing. Yeah. And also what's best is that uh, there are, are already a trend of uh, open source projects that try to clone successful commercial projects, right? Mm -hmm. And you can use them, them as references and see how they actually do the clone work with, in, their, in their code level. Great, yeah, that's a very interesting trick. Uh, just cloning an existing application or maybe even one of the open source ones. That's nice, yeah. great. Um, next, okay, this question here is just about, a little bit about overwhelm. Um, so, Temi Tobe asks, I'm breaking into tech learning, but seeing the amount of information available and the skills out there makes me scared. And I want to know what tips you will suggest to keep me going down this path, because there seems to be so much that you can never learn at all. Yeah, uh, it's a scary for everybody, I think. Uh, yeah, that's so Akash and Jovian, why they're building these uh, courses to help people, right? It's just a time of... Uh, uh, surging, it's everything just explodes. And uh, I, I think there's no need to be uh, too scared. One is that being scared doesn't really help. The other is that if you just think about uh, people who have been in the industry for many years, right? Lots of people are actually been staying in very, 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 very small domains, right? They've been keep working on the same thing for years, right? Especially for people who worked all their career in larger companies, right? Without switching projects, right? So, well, they can still make contribution, yeah. So, uh, they don't. Oh, I, I think they they also feel the anxiety of learning, but uh, for various reasons, they've been working on uh, similar things in the, for several several years. So, if you have this worry, I think you're already mentally and psychologically ahead of many people that you feel the, feel the pressure to learn, right? Yeah, so it's the, it's the same problem for, 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 for everybody in, in the industry, right? Yeah, but uh, uh, it, it's just that, that comparing to many years ago, there, there are more knowledge today, things to learn obviously today, but the way to learn also significantly improved by watching videos or following tutorials, although I said bad things about tutorials, but uh, it, it, it is helpful. But comparing to like 20 years ago, maybe the only way to learn is that you buy a thick book, this thick about C++ language, and you buy, buy the CD-ROMs, install MSDN there to read their docu documentation. It's just yeah. time change, right? Yeah, we, are, we have a lot more to learn, but we can also learn more effectively. So don't be scared. It's, uh, it's not the worst time. It's also not a better time. It's just the, the time we have right now. Great. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, I'll take one last question here about mentorship because I think that was an interesting point that you touched on. Um, so one question here is, how can one get mentorship if you're not working at a company? And then the second one is, how do you ask the right questions to a mentor? Uh, so Manisha says that the only productive conversation I had with my mentor was regarding my career roadmap, but never uh, had any interesting conversation uh, other than that. So yeah, those two things, if you can touch on. 
Okay, uh, probably I'll address it in the, in the rever reverse order. Yeah, that's the exactly kind of mentorship that I, uh, I I'm sorry, I feel don't uh, really work. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's very abstract and high level that I had lots of them in my career. Just, uh, uh, I think, to, to just try, throw out uh, concrete problems. Uh, and uh, if uh, you're not in the same team, uh, explain it uh, as uh, clear as possible, make it as concrete as possible to your mentor. And so that you can have a conversation about the problem. So as I said, I think only during this process, you, you can observe how people think. And that's the thing you want to you wanna get, right? Yeah, the other thing is that I, I'm really not sure about your situation, if it's possible for you to really observe his, his work, that'd be a very helpful. It's, I think it's just a bi-directional uh, thing, right? One is uh, try to in, have an active engagement, a, a mentally active uh, process of a conversation with, with a mentor and force him to do that, so whatever it takes, right? <laughs> Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. It wastes time. Yeah. The other one is to just, just try to uh, try try to observe. Yeah, observing is also also very very helpful. I think. Yeah. Okay. So for the first question, that's uh, mentorship without the job. Uh, yeah, I think this really uh, this really tough. Yeah. So maybe Akash, you can also help me because I I think it's an interesting thing that you mentioned that in your course you actually offer this kind of uh, after learning. Uh, participation and maybe men men mentorship. Yeah. Well, I, I, my personal uh, guess, my guess is that you 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 also find this community, right? The yeah. the learning community. Uh, so offline uh, inter interest group who are uh, focusing on specific domains and participating in that, right? Both online and better offline. Yet, yeah. To 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 find people to uh, to share the that share the same interest. Yeah, I think I agree with you there that. Uh... If you can't find a mentor per se, somebody who can dedicate time and spend time with you, a community is very useful because in a community, you'll always have somebody who is one step, two step, three steps ahead of you. And they will, be, because they know how difficult it is to get to that step, they will be more than happy to share their journey and help you out in the process. And it also helps them improve their understanding. So I think the community aspect is really, I mean, even so we do offer as part of the, our program, we offer these one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship and a lot of people avail that. But towards the end, a lot of people tell us that the most useful conversations that they had are with uh, alumni um, from uh, previous batches or with just their own batchmates or people who are just one or two batches ahead. So I guess community is a good uh, stop gap for mentorship if you cannot achieve that. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Great. Okay. Um, maybe I'll take one last question because this is about uh, specifically around startups and large corporations. So yeah, uh, Chris asks that it's probably easier for somebody from a large co corporation like Microsoft to join a startup. But how does somebody who has built their career so far working at startups, maybe for a few early years, how do they make their way into larger corporations? Okay, yeah. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually uh, easier and easier uh, in, in, these, in these years. I think first of all, uh, technology is becoming a lot more uh, democratic across different companies, right? Uh, sometimes even large companies, they want to acquire people who are using new things to bring new thoughts into the organization. Because as we, as we uh, know that uh, bigger companies move slower, their tech stack also evolves slower, right? They tend to be even worse stuck in the thing that's very old, right? They need new blood and also, uh, because the smaller company, companies, they have the, the gut, uh, they have the opportunity to try out new things earlier, right? uh, faster, they, they, it can actually be an uh, advantage. And also, the, the, way, the opportunity people learn is also very equal uh, today, right? Maybe smaller company people learn even more in their job. Those, uh, that's a that's a uh, perspective. And the, the other thing, uh, pragmatically, how to get yourself noticed or uh, interested by the uh, larger companies that you can do it in various ways, right? If you're, you're working on a promising startup, right? That'll be the best, right? People uh, have heard about your business and maybe even the user of your product, that'd be uh, natural to, to gain extra respect from the interviewer or the higher, higher perspective. And if it's not the case, I think the 
probably today the best opportunity is to work on side open source projects right so keep yourself busy on github right make your contribution real contribution not just the uh fixing typo or documentation right real comp contribution in code uh get recognition from the community uh, so more and more large corporations like Microsoft, who used to be a huge enemy to open source, are now really embracing and make a lot of money by well, GitHub. Yeah. So yeah. So so it's a it's a it's a flat community community now, right? The larger corporation they are fully aware of who are the uh, important person in some open source projects, and this uh, is much better than uh, writing an amazing, uh, much more useful than writing an amazing resume resume, right? Instead, yeah. So that's my two pieces of suggestions. Great. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point that you should use your startup uh, experience as an advantage because you know certain skills which probably nobody else in a bigger company knows and they're looking for somebody who can bring that in. So that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, I think those are all. I've tried to cover most of the questions. I'm really sorry if I could not get to your specific questions. But uh, at this point, Yiming, we would love to also just learn a little bit about Zenstack and um, how you're how you're building it, what it's for, and uh, if somebody wants to try it out, what they should do. Okay, of course. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I think uh, am I still sharing the screen? No, you you can start sharing. Oh, okay. Uh, one minute. Oh, well, extra tip is that, uh, you know, get your peer programmer, a rubber duck. That's really indispensable to a successful career in uh, software development. Uh, yeah, so let's check out uh, Zenstack. Uh, you can see my screen now, right? Um, yeah, if you could just zoom in a little bit, maybe uh, to 150% okay. or so. Okay, better now? Yeah, a little more would be good, but yeah, I can see. Yeah, this is good. Okay, cool, yeah. Uh, I should try to make it brief. Uh, so uh, the idea of ZenStack is about uh, solving the difficulties, some of the difficulties in full stack development, uh, if, especially on the backend side. So I think lots of people who come from a uh, pure front end perspective feel uh, quite scary to uh, to think that there are so many uh, knowledge to 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 obtain on the backend stuff, right? Like database security, etc. So, but uh, I think. Uh, these days, uh, there are new uh, breeds of uh, frameworks like uh, Next ne Next.js, for example, or uh, Re Remix or Next, whatever. This kind of new new frameworks that tries to blend the front end and back end things together into a unified framework, so that you can use the same language like JavaScript or TypeScript across your entire code base, and your front end and back end actually stays in one uh, in, in one project uh, in one repository. So what Zenstack tries to resolve is more on the database programming and also the security aspects. So let me just very, try to very briefly introduce it. So it's a, a Zenstack is based on Prisma, and uh, some people may not know Prisma. And the Prisma is an ORM toolkit. ORM is kind of a library that helps you, instead of using SQL to talk to databases, you use uh, programming languages like uh, JavaScript and TypeScript. And Prisma is an amazing tool. If you uh, program it with a database, you should give it a try and you will love it. It's so much more pleasant than, compare, than uh, using SQL. But uh, traditionally Prisma, you have to use it in the backend and the, because you have to build this API layer to deal with authentication and authorization so that you have proper security model to leak data to, uh, to, to, to people who doesn't have a uh, privilege to access. So ZenStack makes a step forward by extending Prisma besides its data model, for example, this blog post model with these fields listed here. It allows you to add additional access control policies into it. For example, this rule here says that the read operation of the post model is only allowed for uh, not, for non anonymous users, users who have logged in, or uh, and and also it only allows to be vis visible for published posts, and also all other operations like update or delete, etc. They are only allowed for authors. 
So you used to need to write this kind of uh, uh, logic manually with uh, like JavaScript code or TypeScript code in your backend code. But first, those are error prone. When you add a new endpoint, it's very easy to forget to enforce the same set of rules consistently. And secondly, they're hard to maintain, right? Because your logic of, of uh, authorization are spread across many different places. You do not have a single single source of truth. So the reason why we do it this way is to is based on the belief that the best way of maintaining and locating your uh, access policy, your security rules, is to let them reside together with the data model. So let's take a very brief. Uh, overview on how to use the thing uh, in a real product, in a real real project. For example, the first thing is about the de designing your data models, right? It's like your database schema. You have your user uh, entity and you have your post entity, and you define your access policies respectively for these different rules. And also, you run a CLI to generate uh, uh, extra stuff for your model. For example, the <coughs> metadata and also the access policies. And also if you use React as your front end or whatever other front end, you can enable a plugin to generate client side hooks or libraries, access libraries for you. And then with this generation, you can just uh, with a few lines of code, mount the database access as a API, a set of API, API rules into your framework. Here I'm using Next.js as an example, but you can use other frameworks as well. And the last piece is about directly consuming the data, either write or read from your front end code. Uh, you don't really need to wrap your database with API layer just for delegating database access anymore. It's now safe to access the DB directly from the front end, thanks to the access policies you already wrote in those, uh, in those business models. So eventually I think these combinations will uh, help you build a simpler and also more reliable uh, full stack applications uh, when you are using TypeScript as your main program language. And also, yeah, TypeScript, you should learn that if you use uh, do web development, uh, it's gonna be the, uh, future. It's already uh, mainstream, but it's, it's dominated, it, it dominated in, in, the, in the future. Yeah, so uh, that's about the overview. And if you're interested, uh, uh, visit our website, zenstack.dev, and also uh, check out more detailed code on GitHub. And also there on the top, there's a link to join our uh, Discord server so we can chat in more details for your user scenarios and the reporting issues and feature requ requests to us. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, uh, Akash, for the opportunity of introducing our project. Great, thanks, uh, Yiming. And is there a sample project or a, a tutorial that uh, people can try out as well? Yeah, of course. Uh, go to get started, and uh, there are uh, tutorials, and uh, you can find the fully built result here, just uh, to runnable code. And also, there are a step by step tutorial for uh, getting you up to speed. Yeah. Although I said I don't think uh, tutorials are good for serious learning, but I still build them. Yeah, so this well, it's, it's it's necessary for getting started i would say yes, uh, anyway absolutely yeah. yeah great perfect well thanks a lot Yiming. thanks for taking out the time and thanks for sharing your experience uh, i have personally learned a lot so thank you for having this conversation and sharing uh, your um, thoughts on learning and uh, we've also had a great uh, response in the in the chat uh, a lot of people said that they found uh, the entire session really useful so thank you again. Any any final tips you would like to share for the audience and most of the audiences, people who are in the process of getting into their software development career or, or early in their career. So any final tips for them? Yeah, just thank you, Akash, and thank you all the for all the audience for staying with me and uh, <clears throat> spend time listening to this. And uh, I think I just want to congratulate everybody, no matter uh, what kind of stage you are in, you are in the uh, amazing industry, right? Uh, this industry has so many uh, brilliant, intelligent people gathered in it. That's why it's evolving so fast, uh, given that it's been there already for decades, right? Still like a brand new industry. Yeah, it's a very good place to be and a very good place that uh, you're either actively or being forced to just to do continuous learning, a lifelong learning and uh, enjoy the, the journey ahead. Great. Yeah, well, that's a great thought to end on. So thanks, Yiming. And thank you all for joining.
uh, we will see you in our next webinar. In case you uh, haven't joined our WhatsApp group already, you should uh, definitely check it out. I will just share it on the screen. Uh, but thanks a lot, Yiming. And I hope to talk to you again sometime in one of our future events too. Yeah, thank you. And also feel free, the audience, to add me on LinkedIn so we can continue checking in the, in the future. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.